The following is a paid program by Zola Levitt Ministries. He is despised and rejected of men, wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Written 700 years before Christ, Isaiah knew that this prophetic scripture would one day be fulfilled in the Lamb of God, Jesus. The Gospel According to Isaiah with Dr. Jeffrey Seid. Shalom. Hello again. I'm Sandra Levitt. I'm here with Dr. Jeffrey Seif, and we are going to talk about Isaiah today. But first, I'd like to read you some scripture. It's from 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Jeff, I know of no other wonderful writer in the Bible except Isaiah that everyone that we know of Jewish descent that comes to Messiah always talks about Isaiah and what a wonderful, wonderful writer he was and how inspirational they were for him. Absolutely. When questioned, yeah. Jewish people that have come to faith in Jesus will credit that Old Testament prophet Isaiah more than anyone was the one that helped them to make that uh, move over into a belief in Jesus. I love it. I, and I don't know You'd think there would be other writers of the Bible that they would quote, you know, the first five books maybe. But without a doubt, it's always Isaiah. He is so inspirational and so instructive in our salvation. Absolutely. 411 times yeah. New Testament writers are picking up pen or quill and writing out Isaiah words. Fascinating story. It's a story we need to look at. And we're going to look at the Isaiah story and tell the story of Jesus therein. Isaiah is an 8th century prophet before Christ who tells about Jesus' birth, his death, burial, and resurrection. Beginning with his birth, Isaiah chapter 53, it all starts there. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife being great with child. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The prophet Isaiah said in the second chapter, Ba'acharit hayamim, in the last days, he says that the Lord's mountain will be lifted high in verse 3 of the second chapter, he goes on to say, Ki mitzion Torah That from Zion will go forth the Torah, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. What a pleasure it is to be here in the Holy Land to tell the greatest story ever told. We're going to go back in time to the 8th century B.C., and look at the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. We're going to put a number of questions to the text. We want to know, did this prophet speak about the Mashiach, about the Messiah? What did he say, and how did he say it? Interested as I am in his words, I want you to open up with me to Isaiah chapter 53. I want to read this in my version. I want you to read it along in yours, beginning in verse 1. Mi he'amin lishmuotenu. Who has believed our report? Uzroa adonai almi niglota. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Vaya'al kayonek lifonov. For he shot forth as a plant he came forth as a root out of dry ground. Lo torar lo velo hadar. He had no former comeliness that we should look at him. Virnirehu lo mare v'nichmatihu, and he had no particular beauty that we should desire him. Nivze v'chal ishim. He was despised and rejected of men. Ish makovot 
Vidura Choli. He was acquainted with pains and with our diseases. Uchmaster Ponim Mimenu. Nivzev Lo Chashavnehu. He was acquainted with our diseases, as I'd said, and he was as one from whom men hid their face, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Who is this personality spoken of here in the book of Isaiah, many, many hundreds of years before Jesus? Who is this personality that the prophet says, who's going to believe this? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And who is this person who it says that he sprung up as a root out of dry ground? This personality who went on to then be despised and rejected of men. I'd like you to look with me more closely, please, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2. I'm particularly interested in the expression that he came forth as a root out of dry ground. Last time I checked, life doesn't come from the earth if it's not watered. What means the prophet in saying that this Mashiach, this deliverer, comes out of dry ground? I think he left some clues. If you look in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, I want to go back to another prediction here, where Isaiah says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a twig shall grow out of his roots. He says there'll come forth a branch, a netzer. He says he'll come from the stump of Jesse. As you might recall, Jesse is David's parent. You may remember as well that when Yeshua, when Jesus walked the earth from the Holy Land, individuals used to call out, Ben David, son of David. You might recall as well that the book Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, starts off, the book of the genealogies of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Here we're told this, this uh, twig will spring forth from a stump. There's a tree that's cut down comparable to what I'm sitting on, and out of that will come forth this branch. There's earth that's not watered, and out of that will come forth the deliverer. Could it be that what we're looking at in biblical literature is reference to a, uh, a, a womb that brings forth life where there shouldn't be life in that womb? If you'll look with me, please, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, there's another fascinating verse in here. This is incredible. The prophet says, Behold, a young woman will conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Or in the Hebrew version, Hebrew scholars translated the text into Greek and rendered it, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a child and call his name Emmanuel. What does the prophet mean when he speaks about this coming virgin child that will make his entrance onto the stage of the human drama? And what do we know about this child foretold as well? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the government may be increased, and of peace there'll be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it through justice and through righteousness, henceforth and even forevermore. The prophet says the child's going to be born and a son will be given, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So what do we have when we look at the various child texts in Isaiah? What do we observe? That the Mashiach, the Messiah, comes forth as a root out of dry ground. That is to say, unwatered earth. Could this be a reference to a virgin birth? We're told in the 11th chapter that the, that the Messiah will deliver, he will come forth from a stump that's been cut down, dead wood out of which emerges new life. Could this somehow allude to a virgin birth? We're told in the 7th chapter in Isaiah that, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son, and his name will be called God with us. 
Could this be a reference to the virgin birth? And then we're told as well in the ninth chapter, for unto us a son is born, a child is born, a son is given, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's amazing, you know, that when the prophecy is given in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, he starts off saying, who has believed our report? Who's going to believe it? That God would make his entrance onto the stage of the human drama through the virgin Miriam and her betrothed Yosef. They made their way to Bethlehem. There was no room at the inn. And the promise was delivered in a place like this some 2,000 years ago. For insightful perspectives of Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. When you call, be sure to also ask for our free catalog with the latest videos, books, and music. Our correspondence course, the Institute of Jewish Christian Studies, includes reading packets, teaching cassettes, and mail-in tests. You may want to join us on an upcoming tour of Israel, Greece, or the Holy Land Experience theme park in Orlando, Florida. Please contact us for more information. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. In the 8th century before Christ, Isaiah lived and ministered, and he shared that at some point in time, in the not too distant future, God was going to send a redeemer into the world. He said in the seventh chapter that he be born of a virgin. He said in the ninth chapter that his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. He said in the eleventh chapter that he would spring forth from Davidic stock. And he said in the fifty-third chapter that this person would come from a root out of dry ground. He'd come from a womb that hadn't yet been inseminated. And so, 800 or so years later, a woman in Hebrew known as Miriam or Mary came with her betrothed, Yosef or Joseph, came to a place like this, a cave like this in the Holy Land. Finding no room in the inn, Miriam bedded down for the evening and gave birth to the promised Mashiach, the Messiah. One of Jesus' followers, Matthew, tells us in the first chapter of his gospel, picking up in the 18th verse, and by the way, if you have a Bible, please turn to it. He says, now the birth of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, was as follows. After his mother Miriam, or Mary, was betrothed to Yosef, or Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And Yosef, her husband, or betrothed, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Yosef, Joseph, Ben David, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Miriam, your wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, or Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Interestingly, the word Jesus is the anglicized version of the Hebrew Yeshua. And Yeshua comes from a Hebrew verb. It means to save, to deliver, or to redeem. And here, the messenger of the Lord says, call his name Yeshua, or Deliverer, for he will redeem his people of their sins. And not just his people, the Jewish people, but all people. The reason why God sent the Mashiach into the world was to help all people, Jewish people included. We're told in verse 
22 of the same chapter, all this was done to fulfill what was spoken of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah saying, quote, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. You know, I always knew that, uh, you know, growing up in a Jewish family, I'd heard about, you know, the Virgin Mary giving birth to the Christ child. And, you know, I always just thought it was just a, you know, Gentile story, a Christian story. I never really thought that it had its roots in the Old Testament. That Isaiah prophesies about this child coming into the world strikes me as fascinating. I remember it did the very first time I learned the story when someone opened up the scriptures and showed me. And I thought that the implications of that are very profound. Interestingly, a lot of Jewish people take offense at the notion of God sending the Messiah into the world through a womb that couldn't open. The notion of virgin birth seems problematic for a variety of reasons, I grant. But as I pondered it and as I reflect upon it now, I'm reminded of the fact in the Bible, in the Jewish Bible, God always did miraculous things through births that naturally couldn't happen. For example, when you look at the story of Avraham, Abraham and Sarah, there's a story of a man who was frustrated because Sarah couldn't conceive a child. And finally, in chapter 15, verse 3, affirmed to him is that his uh, angst being what it was, God says, I'm still going to deliver a child for you. There, the Jewish race, the biological Hebrew race, came from a womb that God had to miraculously open up. And then we're told the son Yitzchak, or Isaac, he's going to marry a woman, Rivka, Rebecca, and we're told in chapter 25, 21 of Genesis that she couldn't have a child, but that the parents interceded for her and the Lord miraculously opened the womb. And then their son Jacob, Yaakov, he marries, he marries a woman, Rachel, Rachel. We're told that she was Sick with grief in chapter 30, verses 1 and 2, being unable to bear a child. And then God opens her room. I find it fascinating, frankly, when you look at the patriarchs, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, the Hebrew race comes through wombs that can't open. And how fascinating it is that the Lord sent his son to the world, the Messiah, of Jewish extract through a womb that couldn't open. It's all in the Bible, the gospel, according to Isaiah, predicted hundreds of years before he was born, that the Messiah was going to come into the world and come into the world to a virgin. And Jesus said unto them, do not be afraid. Go tell my brethren to go into Galilee. There they will see me. It strengthens our faith to know that Jesus walked on the water and that we can call out to him. And it makes the whole scriptures come to life. Isaiah is great. It's great to look at Isaiah in the Old Testament, and it's great to look at some lives that were touched by Isaiah in the modern world. And Sandra, I understand that you were with Jacob Damkani in Israel and had a great story to tell. I was. Before we got to the interview, we were just talking about what we were going to talk about in his testimony. And he said, you know, Isaiah 53 really was how I came to know Messiah. Completely unscripted. He unscripted, just came out with it. had no idea he was going to say it. What we had told him was that we were talking about testimonies and what was his testimony. And then we got through with the talking to him and we said, we're doing a, a program on Isaiah. And he said, it couldn't, you know, it was a God thing. We knew it right then and there that it was a God thing. He and millions like him, well, millions is maybe overstated, but Jewish people, right. so many have come to faith through Isaiah. Let's go to that interview now. Shalom, Jacob. It's good to see you again. I, we have been talking about your parents, and I know your parents come from Iran. What a timely issue to talk about coming from Iran and coming to know the Messiah. How did you come to know the Messiah? For me, it all started in New Jersey. In New Jersey. Of all places. Of all places. Of all places. Is any good thing coming out of New Jersey? 
Well, I don't know. You tell me. Well, for me it was. Yeah. For me, indeed, something great happened. When a man named Jeff walked into my shop, I was importing at the time from uh, Mexico, mm -hmm. from Israel, gift, jewelries. Yeah. And on my yeah. desk, I had my Bible. And when I say my Bible, I refer to the Old Testament only. Right. And uh, this man, when he sees the Bible in Hebrew, he gets really excited. He's all shining. And he began to really confront me with uh, Yeshua. Where was he from? From New Jersey. He was from New Jersey also, but he knew it was a Hebrew Bible. Right. He, wow. he, he knew enough about Hebrew. He lived in Israel for quite some time. He was knowledgeable somewhat of Hebrew. Right. And uh, for him, it was uh, a great, great surprise to meet an Israeli. Right. So he started really sharing the gospel with me. And the first reaction, like most Jews, wait a minute. I'm a Jew, right. we have God, right. you have his son, Yeshua. we have Moses, right. you have... Right. 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 But the guy was very, very knowledgeable of the Old Testament, and he began to really open the Old Testament to me. Now, this wasn't like a work of one day. No, no. And he started visiting me once a week, twice a week, right before I closed the shop and began to unfold prophecies before me. Wow. What did he start with? He really started with Isaiah 53. He really did start with Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, wow. and it was really shocking to me for the first time in my life to really read that chapter with the insight of a child of God named Jeff who really had me understand that this is really about Yeshua. And from there, he took me to Daniel chapter 9, where we grow up to think when Messiah come, nation shall not lift up swords against nation, and the world will dwell with the Lamb. Yes, but there in yes. Daniel 9, you see that Messiah has to be cut off. And then he takes me to Ezekiel 36, which was right. really powerful, where God promised, and I think this is one of the greatest promises of all, that he himself, the Almighty One, will cleanse me, will purify me, will just give me a new heart, a new spirit. And in the light of this great promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 and few other prophecies, I found myself with my back up against the wall and I had a decision to make. It's either I'm going to listen, my father, my mother, the rabbis I grew up with, the teachers in school, or am I going to give attention to the prophets? And I tell you, when I just took time to keep examining that and I realized if I read those prophecies objectively, they really do speak clearly about Yeshua. Yeah. That's where I found the courage to read the New Testament. When I saw what I saw in the Old Testament, I found the courage to take a hold of the New Testament and begin reading it. And uh, I was shocked. Everything I read in the New Testament brought me to Galilee. Where did you start in the New Testament? I always love to hear this. And Matthew. I started from the beginning. You did start from the very beginning. A lot of people start in John, but that's no, interesting. That's I start cool. from the very beginning and right there, the, the lineage of Yeshua got yes. hold of my yes. attention yes. to really see that he uh, didn't come from no Catholic pop, but he's descendants of Israel, right? And then He's a Jewish Messiah. And I didn't read nothing about no eggs of Easter's and nothing about the trees of Christmas. And I didn't hear the sounds of the bells of the church, but I heard the sound of the shofar. And I came in touch with the feast which I grew up. Pesach is Pesach. Oh. And, 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 and tabernacle is tabernacle. And the feast of Pentecost is Pentecost. And the Sabbath right. is the Sabbath. Right. And, and even Hanukkah. And even Hanukkah is there in the book of John. Yes. And, and, and I tell you, when I realized that this is a Jewish document and I come to understand that my identity is not being jeopardized, I have come to realize that, wow, if this is true, I want to get a hold of that. And uh, as Jeff put it to me, you ask God and God right. will show you. And I tell you, on my knees, on my knees for a few weeks, God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If this is my promised Passover lamb, if this is the one that you have promised that will come to cleanse me, mm -hmm. purify me, take my heart of stone, and give me a heart of flesh, and make me a habitation of your very presence, you give me that great truth 
and I will obey, I will be your slave, I will take my ear to the doorpost, I will serve you for as long as I live. And okay. in his grace and his mercy, he has come and paid me a visit, 1997, oh. 1977, Marvelous. and nothing has been the same. All of a sudden, there and there, I have realized what does it mean to be a Jew. And my heart cry was for all my people Israel, for them to for mm -hmm. once understand Yeshua in a Jewish context. Information is great. Inspiration is better. We've gotten some information from Isaiah and inspiration from Jacob Damkani. But hear me, what's better than information and inspiration is transformation. That said, I want to invite you to open up your hearts and mind to what's revealed in biblical literature. Because not only does Jacob Dumkani have testimonies, but everyone and anyone who reaches up to God and asks him into their heart and repents of their sins, they get testimonies too. And we want the best for you. We don't want to just tell a story that informs. We want a story that transforms. And I want you to know, and Sandra wants you to know, that the promises of God are available to you. Isn't that right? You know, Jeff, we were talking about Isaiah. And you know, his name means the Lord saves. Yes, we're it talking does. about salvation, and that's great. We've got more programs coming up. We've got at least seven more that we're going to do about salvation, about Isaiah. Please join us. And as you go, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer on this program, The Bible Jesus Read, is an entertaining and thorough tour of the Old Testament, a readable study that is relevant to all who want to understand the beginning of God's plan and the roots of the church on earth. The theology is understandable and treated with thoroughness. The Bible Jesus Read. And you may also call toll-free for our colorful monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. This free publication includes Bible lessons, insightful news commentary, Hebrew lessons, and more. Call 1-800-WONDERS. That's 1-800-966-3377. Or write to Zola, Box 12268, Dallas, Texas 75225. You can also see our Levitt Letters, TV programs, and national airing schedule at www.levitt.com. Please remember Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.